Yeah. All right. So since we get into minutia, uh, Jeremy, you're you're the guitar geek. The, hit him with your best shot here with your questions on the on the guitars and the tones and all that stuff that you always go for. It's all it's all, <laughs> it's all Jackson's, right, Doug? It was for a little for a minute. It well, was, Doug's um, a less all guy now, aren't you? Last couple of years. Well, I mean, it's been a lot longer than that. It's um, I started with a Les Paul. That was my first right. guitar, and um. How'd you afford only, Les Paul as your first guitar? Because it was three hundred dollars, and I had a hundred. My mom gave me the the other two. Nice. You still have it? No, but I have about six that are identical to it. But um, no, I started with a Les Paul. I started with a copy Les Paul, then I got a real Les Paul, and eventually I butchered that thing. It was a, a deluxe with mini humbuckers, and I I drilled it out and put um, humbuckers, and then the frets. It wasn't playing great, and I ended up getting a Strat with a tremolo bar and um but what i had seen randy rhodes play with jackson and i i felt a jackson strat at the mm. music store and i thought this is like this has got that it feels like a les paul and a strat together and so i got i ordered one of those and got it and i made friends with grover jackson and that's where the jackson connection came in um ja he he was super nice to me and um took me under his wing, brought me to, into the family. And I, I was there with Jackson until he left. And then I kind of bailed. I always would record with, with I had a, a black custom that was my main guitar go-to for the studio. Mm. But for live, you know, it couldn't, it didn't have the whammy bar or anything. So I would use the Jackson. But eventually when Grover left, I just kind of soured on the Jacksons. And I had, I went to Fender for a little while, played with, played some of their stuff. Mm. Always kind of, you know, I was never exclusive with anybody other than Jackson really at the time. And uh, eventually um, around 2000 or 99, somewhere around there, I started using Les Paul more exclusively. Mm. And then when I joined Dio, um, the Les Paul was definitely heavier than my Super Strat. I had a, a Super Strat humbucker Strat and the, the, the Black Custom would, I would use it for Sabbath and stuff like that because it was just darker and heavier. Yeah. And it's one of my, it's a 73, that one. And it's one of my, it's probably my best sounding, best recording guitar. But um, so then when I joined Whitesnake, now this is 2002. I, I was touring with Ronnie and I joined Whitesnake on a 2003 tour. And then it went on. But David said, I love that you're playing Les Pauls. I want you to, um, to you know, do that with, with us. And I'm like, yeah, that's my main guitar. Anyway, it just, you know. Mm -hmm. With with Ronnie, he was covering Rainbow and some other stuff, and the Strat worked out great for that. And, you know, right, the whammy. It's not really, that. yeah, and the, and the front pickup would really get a great. And it's a faster um, playing guitar as well, so it's like, you know, actually, it's weird for me. Strats fight back a little bit more. Les hmm. Pauls are pretty pretty more shreddable, but um, but I just I, I just always have loved Gibsons. I, I've think you know a collector of that stuff for a long time and and now i you know have a little of this and a little of that but my go-to guitar is a gold top let's fall just like i started on wow what about um this you're actually a good person to ask this question to you know in the 80s there was a, so many different types of like guitar tones going on you know if you were in motley crew you obviously you sounded like mick mars and you had a process tone if you're Eddie Van Halen towards the late 80s, you had more of more and more of a process tone. People weren't just plugging direct to the front of the amp, turning it up to 11 and just playing anymore. There was so much going on. Were you pressured into following those trends and playing with all the process tones and everything? Or have you just always been straight into the amp kind of guy? No, I, I've tried everything. And it's I'll tell you one thing, man. I, um, I always had a, a tone that people were complimentary about. And it was something that I just... I took a six band MXR, I took a, a, a DOD preamp that was just straight gain and I cranked that thing to 10, I think. And then it went into a MXR six band and I jacked up the mids and into a Marshall, so same Marshall I still have, it's a 79 um, Super Lead and JMP. And, um, but it was noisy. So then, then they came out with the hush and then I put the hush in there and it was like, okay, it's quiet, but now it, I can't really do clean tones. Yeah. So then I was like, but the tone was massive. It sounded really good. Oh, oh, and by the way, I learned that the MXR stereo chorus, if you stuck that, if you took, took, made a Y chord coming out of the a hush 
And right. One side went directly to the Marshall. The other side goes to the to the um, MXR stereo chorus. And you put a little modulation on that and send that to another amp. Then you've got this big, huge yeah. Randy Rhodes kind of sound. A wide and that, sound, yeah. Yeah. And then the other output of that stereo chorus would go into a, a delay unit that would go to a. Um, sorry about that. My yeah. ring yeah. camera's going on. Um, yeah. So anyway, so it was just it started like that, but I couldn't get a clean sound because of the hush. So Hmm. Then I got an AB box and I got a Roland JC120 and that AB box would give me the JC120 and that was clean. Clean tone. And the other sound. I did that for a long time and it was it was really cool. But eventually... Oh, um, setup. There's a lot going on there. It was a little even more than that. But but eventually... Hey, Doug, I, Doug's no rookie. Well, no, no, no. But me. I, <laughs> eventually... Like he's a good person this, to ask these questions. Right? The thing was just, just trying to experiment to get the sound that you yeah. hear in your head you know and that's what i was trying to do and have coverage of different sounds that i wanted to get in my head that i were in my yeah. head but then what i found sound, out about bob, bob bradshaw oh about yeah Look, say. i just want to tell you about the process tone thing really quick yeah so, we'll go. And then we'll, so i meet bob bradshaw i i'm in hurricane i got this sound that i've started with but now i want to take it further and he had these things called um uh Rocktron made these things called juice extractors and you plug your amp output into the juice extractor and then you could EQ the, the sound before it went to the speaker. Hmm. And then there was a thing called a BBE sonic maximizer that added more bottom end. So I had this, I, long story short, I did have a rack, of a Bradshaw rack. I had a Bradshaw rig that it was pretty expensive. Um, I just put all my money that I had mm. into it. But mm. man, my guitar sound was mm. massive. It was, <laughs> it was, it was just giant. It was like, you know, at this time, guys like um, John Sykes had come out. He had a, he had a giant sound. There was a yeah. lot of, you know, Tony Iommi had a giant sound. Eddie did. Everybody was going for this big stereo sound, especially in LA. It was like an LA thing too. I mean, Lukather had it. Yeah. But um, eventually, when when grunge came out, it was like. Okay, we don't need all that stuff anymore. Yeah, they, Those they guys dialed it just, back. French killed <laughs> it. Dialed, they ruined it. They, ruined they dialed it. it back, but but it's all it's all a, it's all a, it's a natural pro process. So you so eventually we we find a, a, a balance that works. So when I, by the time I got in White Snake, I had a, a rig that was pretty raw, but I also had some patches with some schmooze on it for like is this love or whatever. Right. And um, with the, with the Dead Daisies, this is a more straight ahead. Rock straight up gr gritty rock and roll band we've taken a little bit of a turn now because of, with glenn we, we've got a, a possibility of, of creating more landscape for him and uh so you know maybe there's going to be some different tones going on but i basically hmm. have gotten lazy and it's kind of like i tried the, like the kemper and everything and it's killer oh. it's just un unbelievable yeah but they sound good but it's just too deep for me, right? I just can't. I'm used to. Yeah. I, I know this amp sounds good. I plug it in and it sounds no. good. Dude, same thing with me. It's like I post like you know a, a guitar video or two online. And, you know, I got a stomp box. I'm like, I'll check this. People are like, wow. why don't you just get a Kemper? Or why don't you just get a Fractal? You got all that built in. I'm like, no, I'm a guitar player. I want to turn the knob. I want to step on the thing. I want to you know be able to sit there and dial it in. I don't want to be clicking on a mouse. It's it's you know mixing now in Pro Tools and everything. It's all in the mouse, all on the screen. One day is going to come. The guitar is going to actually be on the screen. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, it's like I want to enjoy turning the knob. You're playing on, on the screen. Yeah. yeah, the fingers, the fingers are on the screen. It's like whose hand do you want to have? Do you want? <laughs> let's get let's get Jeremy's hand on on this song. So that's what it sounds yeah. like. That's it. You know, but, all of a sudden you'd be like, oh man, it'd be great if we get like a Dan Huff jangle part on this. Yeah, Dan, or, you know, we love Dan. You you, it's funny you bring up Dan Huff because I thought about him yesterday. I want to I want to listen to some giants, some old because that was a big Ooh. badass process sound. But yeah. let me say this about the, about what's going on with the Daisies is that Ben Gross, the producer, did not mix in Pro Tools. He did it old school. He was very interesting. He, he, I never heard what the mix was going to sound like. Every time he put the song, even though it was recorded in Pro Tools, hmm. every time he put a song up, he just it would be coming up through the mixer. He he get his mix. And it would be a little different every day. And um, wow, I never knew what it was going to sound like until the end. And he mixed it. And it's it's like so, you know, in the 
the way most people mix, and I, you, we've all done this, you mix in the box, and then every time you open it up, it comes back exactly how you had it. Right. And it's it saves everything. But he didn't. He doesn't do that, and I really respected that, and I think it it helped the sound, you know, by him doing yeah. it old school. Because it's a fresh mix every time we put the faders up. Wow. Yeah, he never got he never got stuck into anything. It's really it's something to think about, you know. If you when you make a demo in Pro Tools, a lot of times it sounds like a finished album, and right. then where do you go from there? You know, it's like it yeah. gets a lot of a lot start, of bands get the a lot of bands get demoitis because of that, you know. Yeah, first, first oh, yeah. Eight, sounds great, and then you go and there's okay, yeah. well, how do we make this better? Okay, well, we're already using the drum samples that we would have used on the mastered product. Well, you, what happens is a lot of times too is you do that demo and then you go in and recut the drums and replace the drum machine. You recut the drums and then then you go okay, recut the drums now. But now the guitars don't sound as good as they did before, so we got to recut the guitars. Uh, it, it ends up like being really backwards. Yeah, it's like it, it ends up being a really it's, tedious. It's not the well, it's not the it's not the organic way to do it. The way to do it is to get in a room and play together and and figure out the parts that you think you mm -hmm. sound good and do your tracking and then go back and listen after you track, go back in the control room and listen and go, well, that was kind of cool. I like that. I'm going to just keep doing that. That other part needs work. Um, I'm going to either, I got an idea or I'm going to ask somebody, what do you guys think? You know? Yeah. And it's just like a regular old, old school band, you know, it's kind of come full circle now. You know, uh, Jeremy's working on his first album, record deal on the table, the whole thing, and he's doing it all by himself. And he's doing that whole Mutt Lang approach of everything has to be perfect, right? Yeah. He, Gene Simmons told you not to do this. Yeah, I know, but there's there's a certain hey, sound, man, right? There's no rules. You can do what you want. Exactly. Yeah. You know, right. I was saying to Mitch, I was like, you know, a lot of these songs that I'm working on, it's like there's guitar parts and stuff. It's like, unless I'm playing the tracks, there's no way I'm going to be able to have, you know, like a seven piece band playing all this stuff. And, and then I, I, I was talking to Phil Collins from Def Leppard on Monday, uh, interviewed him. And he was saying that, you know, when we were recording Hysteria, we just didn't, we didn't even have the intention of like, you know, how are we going to play these live? Like, we didn't even think about that. We were just trying to create the best sounding, you know, mm -hmm. album and record. And then worry about playing it live after the fact. And like Hysteria, they had to rent an arena for two days and just go over and over and figure out uh, an, an arrangement for like Love Bites. Like, how are you going to play this live and sing at the same time, you know? So it's, it's so interesting to hear different people's perspectives and approaches when it comes to recording, you know? They do. They, they pull it off good, though. They sound great. And you know who else sounded great is that there were some really over, like, I don't want to say overproduced, but it was seriously produced. Was Boston? Yeah. The old. If you look on YouTube, the Boston stuff is, um, you know, the, Tom Schultz Tom, just, and Barry Barry Gaudreau on guitar was just on fire, and the bass player. Yeah. Bass, Dude, the whole Fran band. and the sound of the record, like it still sounds so good. You listen to it on the radio, and then they go into like a modern sounding album. It kills it. It kills the but modern like, sounding stuff. But and live they pulled it off. They did like just like Def Leppard, and I think they do it. They, you know, there was no tapes or anything, or I wouldn't think there was, anyways. Yeah. Well, Let's yeah. just say I hope there wasn't. No. no well, um, I, I asked Phil really... Collin that. I asked him, I was like, you know, uh, do you play the tracks and stuff? And he's like, well, in the interview, he said to me, he's like, honestly, he's like, when we were recording the stuff, we recorded stuff that we'd be able to pull off live if we had to. He's like, if you couldn't sing it, it didn't make the album because we knew we wouldn't be able to do it live, you know? And he could do it. Those guys all sing their ass off. I mean, Viv's, Viv's a great singer. Joe yeah. obviously is the yeah. tone of the band. Yeah. Sav and 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 Phil might be. I mean, he's he's a brilliant singer. He sounds just <laughs> like he can sound exactly like Joe. It's weird. It's like he yeah. they double the parts, and it's like that's how they get that fat sound. It's because yeah. he's got that even sound Mutt. Too. You know, Mutt sang a lot of those backing vocals on the records too. You know, like the love bites, like a love bites, like all those high parts, like that was all <laughs> Mutt. Yeah. Well, wow, no. I didn't know that. <laughs> 